And welcome to Ken O'Keefe's Middle East Show. We're here for our second show, and I tell you what, how many lessons were learned on the first one? I can't even begin to tell you, but there's one lesson I learned, and that was throwing out the teleprompter. No auto cue for me. While I might miss some things and make some mistakes along the way, my strength is most definitely when I come straight from the heart. And as much as I tried to write something and actually read it from the auto cue, it simply did not work. So I'm happy to say I'm not planning on doing that. I will use trusty notes. I think that'll work just fine. Now this week we've got a great show, uh, really some fantastic people. Uh, on the show today. We've had another report from Nur Harazin in Gaza just yesterday. In fact, while we were on a Skype interview with her, uh, the Israelis were continuing what they do best. They were beginning another incursion into Gaza. And we'll tell you the latest in Gaza uh, coming from Nur Harazin down in Gaza herself. We also have a couple of guests, which I'm so happy to have. One is Rodney Shakespeare, uh, an incredible uh, man in terms of his understanding of the financial system. And of course, I will continue to bring it back to the financial system. When we talk about the Middle East and wanting to improve things for the Middle East, actually the same issues that are facing the Middle East face us here in the West. And at the head of that is indeed the financial system. So when we talk about the financial system and improving that situation, we're talking about improving the Middle East as well. Rodney is going to help us decipher some of the issues which are key, including the petrodollar system, and I've got a video later in the program as well, which we'll get into that in even greater detail. We also have Chris Coverdale. Chris is an awesome guy, somebody very, very uh, close to my heart because he also refuses to pay taxes. I did so for many years before I left the United States, and while I haven't made enough uh, to actually pay taxes in this country yet, uh, if I do, I will happily go to prison before I would pay into a tax system being used to murder my brothers and sisters halfway around the world based on lies. Chris feels the same way as I do, but the beauty of Chris's argument is that there is actually uh, a reasonable interpretation of law which makes clear that you are actually breaking the law, UK law and international law, by paying into the tax system. So we're going to talk about that and uh, hopefully, more importantly, we're going to achieve the goal that is really set for me with regard to the Middle East show and that is to incite people to do what is necessary to actually affect change. We could sit here and have a show and talk about all the nuances and all the details about what's happening in the Middle East, but what is the point really unless we're going to get some people to actually do what's necessary to make the change? And who are those people? Well, if you ask me, it's not anybody but ourselves. If we want to go and find out who is actually responsible for the world we're living in, then the first thing to do is go stand in front of a mirror, take a good hard look, and ultimately see, say to yourself, am I actually doing everything that I'm capable of doing? For everybody, that level is different. But if we want to change things, both in the Middle East or in the world, we're going to need to take responsibility. And my real goal with this show is to get people to not only take responsibility, but actually do what they're capable of doing. Now, back to the financial system. Ultimately, what we're talking about when we're talking about the financial system is, is a great, great manipulation and an intentional, willful design to ultimately enslave the people. Now, there's one major manipulation when we talk about the financial system that most people almost regurgitate on cue when you mention not paying taxes. What most people will say is, oh, but if we didn't pay taxes, the whole system will fall apart, health care, the trash being picked up, and all of these things will fall, education, none of this will, we will fall and descend into anarchy. That is a lie. It's a manipulation. The fact is, if you want to get really truthful, our taxes are actually going to pay the interest on the debt to the richest of the rich bankers who effectively run the world through the control of the issuance of debt-based money, a fractional reserve system. We are, when we pay our taxes, paying interest on debt. If we bypassed the bankers and actually had a money-based system that we issued with no usury, no debt, and we did it in a transparent way, we could avoid all of the trillions that we supposedly owe to the bankers, and we could have a system which would save us ungodly amounts of money and actually allow for world-class health care for everyone, not just the people in the West who've had a comparatively good life, but everyone around the world. But we're going to get into more of that, and here's a great video that we picked up which really applies to the American taxpayer, and it asks the question, where exactly does your money go? People have to realize that 
53 cents of every dollar that they're paying in taxes is going to the military. It's an astonishing figure. There's an enormous, enormous amount of money being blown on war and killing and destruction. But well, well, break this down. Break this down a little bit. You know, how much money? Where's it going? Well, look, there's a $3 trillion 2011 budget proposal. It'll probably go a little higher, but they always do. But, you know, so let's round it up, $3 trillion that uh, is being proposed for the next year. Um, and of that, that includes a direct Pentagon budget request of $717 billion at this point. That will also rise, as it always does. There's a proposal for $158 billion. They call it, now they call it contingency fund uh, for the two wars, but that will rise. Then you got $40 billion in black box intelligence funding that doesn't get written in the budget but really what is, is that they never tell us how much they spend on the cia and the nsa and the dia and all these different intelligence activities which are all war related but uh, a couple of years ago there was a error in testimony in the congress that leaked that the black budget on intelligence was 37 billion dollars but i suspect that it's probably closer to 50 or 60 billion because if you think about it the cia is basically running the predator uh, operation in Pakistan, and that's got to be hugely expensive. So, you know, I suspect that the intelligence budget is probably m much more than 40 billion I gave it. Then you got another almost 100 billion in non Department of Defense military spending, and that includes things like uh, the military portion of NASA, military spending by the State Department. Remember, they hire all those military contractors to guard their uh, embassy operation in Iraq and their embassy operation in Afghanistan and so on. It's pretty huge. And you've got the Homeland Security budget that is largely military, and then the VA, $123 billion in veterans benefits for the uh, damaged goods from all our wars. And finally, there's $400 billion in interest on the debt to pay for our prior wars. And that's just the interest. So that all adds up to $1.6 trillion. $1.6 trillion? Dollars and sort of like, how does that compare to the uh, recent health care bill? Like, where, what's the. Oh, the recent health care bill was a trillion dollars for 10 years, over 10 years. But we're talking about 1.6 trillion in one year. 1.6 trillion dollars. So we could have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Next time you hear that the government needs to cut funds for providing medical care to the children of laid-off workers or that supplemental unemployment funds are running out, next time you hear that federal funds that are needed to fund extra teachers at your school are being cut or that Social Security benefits need to be cut back or retirement age needs to be increased to 70, next time you hear your local post office has to be shut down for lack of funds, next time you hear that Medicare benefits need to be reduced, think about that 53% of your tax payment that's going to finance the most enormous war machine the world has ever known. And that's the truth. Welcome to the Middle East Show. While we focused on Palestine in the first issue, an issue that is completely and totally dear to my heart, there is an issue that transcends that in terms of importance, if you ask me, and that would be the financial system. If we have one common thing that we're struggling against in this world, if we have an interest in replacing injustice with a just, peaceful world, then there is no question at all that the head of the snake is indeed the financial system. So with that, I'd like to speak to my dear friend and guest, Rodney Shakespeare. And, and before we get into some of the Middle Eastern related aspects of the financial system, this quote here by uh, our good man, Mr. Rothschild, give me control of a nation's money and I care not who makes its laws. Does that pretty much encapsulate the financial system? Tell me, what is the financial system in terms of its effect on all of us around the world? Well, Ken, you refer to the head of the snake, the thing which is the, the top of evil, as it, as it were. Um, the problem is that we have been conned and deceived into accepting that the private banking system may always create money out of nothing, not lending its own money, but create it out of nothing. Added administration costs, which is fair, but then add interest. Mm. But then comes the crux of the matter, then never to put it into the real economy and the spreading of the real economy. So finance capitalism, at its heart, has a global finance banking system, uh, which is acting for its own benefit, essentially using interest to uh, suck up wealth into the hands of that 1% in, 
elite and is not using its mechanism, which is the money-creating mechanism, for the benefit of the other 99. And it, it's, this is what it's inherently designed to do, isn't it? This isn't an accident. It isn't at, oh, well, the system isn't quite working. No, the system is working perfectly well. It is designed to extract resources from the many into the hands of the few. But even more importantly, and, and tell me if I'm wrong here, more than money, which in itself is, is inconsequential to these people, those who control the banking system have literally infinite supply. They can put as many zeros into bank accounts as they want. What this is really about is control. Ultimately, the financial system is designed to enslave us. And, and, and in a way, I actually kind of admire these uh, psychopaths because if they can actually get away with this, if they can actually get us, the masses, to agree to this system, unwittingly or not, who's really at fault here? Because they couldn't do this, could they, unless we consented to it. Well, f first of all, you, you're quite right. It goes much further than money. Ultimately, it goes I into power which is what it's re really about. Uh, as for our consent, uh, the reason why we give consent is that we accept about 60 false, essentially lies. And whilst we do that and we do not address them, we are always going to be conned and deceived. May let me take one example. An independent national bank. Most, independent, uh, most national banks are claimed to be independent, for example, the Bank of England, and mm. it is nothing of the sort. Mm. It acts purely as a sort of functionary, easing the control of the private uh, sector. And everybody is deceived on this. And this is no different from the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States or the European Central Bank. It's, these banks are not in any way loyal to the European people, the British people, or the American people. It's a private cabal of bankers which extract the wealth from the many and ultimately concentrate power even further. And doesn't it explain to me, this explains the world, why the world is so upside down. We talk about terrorism and we direct the, our attention elsewhere. Actually, we're the terrorists. It's, it's upside down. Everything is this way, and it's because of the concentration of power that the bankers have. Basically, they can buy anything and anyone that can be bought. So the only people that gravitate to positions of power are those who are corrupt. And the people who actually have honor and integrity and who cannot be bought cannot gravitate to those positions. The entire system is used to subdue and punish such people. And if you change that system of power, ultimately, we can change the world. But as long as this system of power, the financial system, remains in place, we will find ourselves being outspent literally billions to one. And the system works by increasing debt all the time. And the young people are now all put into debt, and that controls them and stops them being um, idealistic, young, and going for new things, because they are controlled by the effects of huge debt in their lives. They have to toe the line, and mm. they uh, know it. We're really selling our children into slavery. And I tell you what, Rodney, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about this subject in detail and those 60 false uh, assumptions that people are making. But let's now move specifically into the Middle East and the petrodollar system, a very interesting system which has some major benefits for these same psychopaths who run the financial system. Can you please kind of give us a general understanding of how the petrodollar system works? Well, the petrodollar system, sort of in its origin, is really an agreement between, shall we say, the USA and Saudi Arabia, simply that oil should be sold in dollars. But then it goes to the other countries which come involved in this. And you had then a system in which all the oil was being uh, sold in uh, dollars. And therefore, countries without oil have to get hold of dollars in order to, mm -hmm. um, to, to, to buy the oil. Now, this has an effect... If, if Nigeria had this deal, they would be the superpower, wouldn't they? That's Whatever right. nation would have gotten this deal would have had such a tremendous advantage over the rest of the world that they would have been the ultimate superpower. Well, the, 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 this system then gives the dollar, the American dollar, uh, essentially an ability to create itself and spend on its military spending. You may, people may wonder why the, the USA is, it has got 700 bases around the world, has been involved in war every year since I've been alive or I've been conscious, <laughs> and it's, it's trying to get into two or three wars at this moment. And how does it finance that? The answer is this system, which ultimately is a petrodollar system, and then it's then spilt over into trade. So all the time everybody says, well, we must have dollars. It's the only stable currency. Now, isn't it true it's that... Not. When, when the, the U.S. dollar became the, the global currency with the Bretton Woods agreement, that the agreement was that it, the U.S. dollar would also be backed by gold, 
And all the, basically all the nations of the world agreed to this system, which I'm not sure exactly why they did, unless they were agreeing to uh, a very tyrannical system. But nonetheless, that was the agreement. But what happened with Vietnam, now correct me if I'm wrong, with Vietnam, it showed the United States was spending enormous amounts of money, which really couldn't be justified by any valid budgeting. And the world realized that they were using this petrodollar system, uh, supposedly back well, before the petrodollar system, excuse me, a gold-backed system, to finance a military that was spending enormous amounts in Vietnam. And eventually, uh, the other nations of the world said, listen, we're going to want our gold back, please, because you're devaluing the dollar by spending tremendously like this, and we're losing by having, uh, being part of this system. I is that essentially correct, or, or please correct me where that, I'm that's, wrong? That's quite right. And the, the recognition that the American dollar was being printed to fund its military spending uh, came and hit the world in 1971 or 72, just about where you're refer referring to. Uh, but then, of course, uh, what has happened since then is that the world, the system has got actually worse. The dollar's being printed even more. There's even more. America spends nearly half the world's uh, total of uh, mili military spending. And then you talked about people wanting their gold back. Well, the question is, is whether there is any gold in Fort Knox where the Americans allege it. They refuse, they absolutely refuse to have those gold ho holdings where it is, most of it is gold held for other people. And this is, uh, you know... To be audited. They won't allow it. And they, it's not wh there. Why wouldn't they allow it if there was gold there? there? So we, we've got to conclude it's not there, obviously. And, and, and I think it was 71 or 73, we got onto the petrodollar system when, when uh, Nixon basically said, no, we're not going to honor the gold bag dollar. We're not going to uh, provide any of the gold back to any of you. Um, and that was the birth of the petrodollar system. And, and ultimately, here we go, uh, we're, you know, early 70s, we start this system. Is it fairly true that this was essentially a deal to, to transfer, instead of a gold-backed dollar, we had a petrodollar uh, system, an oil-backed dollar, uh. which maintained this system of hegemony? It, it, it's linked with several aspects. It's linked with maintaining autocratic regimes in the Middle East. That's the relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia, which goes back much further than the early 1970s. Um, it's also linked with the global financial system, which says that everything has to be done at interest and for the interests of the uh, elite. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, the Middle East generally, the problem in the Middle East is that... Um, there is very lack of understanding, as there is in the West, uh, that they are being controlled either by the global financial system or by their own elites mm. who use the system. And neither of those two are prepared to use the money supply for the real economy for all the people inside. Well, and, and is, I, I'm sure that this is true, but again, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we've been bought off in the West. We've had comparatively, despite the fact that there are plenty of people struggling in, in the West, in America, you know, black people and other minorities have struggled okay. very deeply and continue to struggle to this day. But we had a large middle class. People were relatively comfortable. And ultimately, <laughs> we, we were quite blind to the sufferings of the rest of the world under this system. And, and especially my birth nation was running roughshod and bombing the crap out of, you know, one nation after another. Um, but now it's getting more uncomfortable for people. As this financial system finds the U.S. dollar, the inflationary rate going up and up and up, the dollar's worth less and less and less, people seem to be understanding more and more. But are we not heading towards a dollar collapse? Is this not inevitable? The real earnings for the American middle class have been going backward for nearly 25 years. Therefore, what's called the American dream, you know, that you can get a house and have some income and, and feel secure, mm. uh, that's gone out of the window, and the American middle class is being, uh, is being wrecked, and you're getting this huge rich-poor division, in exactly the same way as you really got in the Middle East in country after country. You see, n the global financiers and their acolytes and the academics will never address the issue of where money comes, what it's used for, and because they assume that the free market quote is always efficient and always just. And that assumption comes from the victory over communism in 1989. Uh, but it's wrong and it's now being revealed as a system which is not efficient, which is unjust, which increases debt and um, it has no means of distributing productive power to the bulk of the population. And that's in, in America, there's 
five, six million jobs have been exported. Each job is worth three. That's 15, 20 million jobs have publicly been exported because of the doctrines that whatever the finance system does, whatever the big corporations do, is trickle down is for the, for the benefit of everybody. I'm afraid the whole thing is collapsing round, and at some point the American dollar will suddenly collapse because it's the point you were making. It's early in 1970s. That was the point when the real fundamental weakness of the American dollar was revealed. And it's, the weakness has been there ever since and getting worse. And, and this is where I, um, I want to focus, is, is the connection between the two. While the American people in the West in general has remained blind when they could have clearly seen what this system was doing, especially to the Middle East and other parts of the world, Africa for instance, this petrodollar system has allowed the U.S. empire to expand at such a rate is un unprecedented. And the suffering that has come from policies which are intended to remove people who would have, for instance, we go back to Mossadegh in Iran in the 50s, remove CIA coup. Mossadegh was going to nationalize the oil. He was going to take away the sweetheart deal for Western companies, British companies. We look at Saddam Hussein, who uh, was our little attack dog, our little pit bull, who was doing his, our bidding for so long. But when he fell out of favor and ultimately uh, was no longer the uh, counted on dictator of Iraq, um, he was moving to the euro instead of the dollar, and it wasn't much longer after that that we know what happened to him. Um, this system has caused so much suffering in the Middle <clears throat> East. Is it, it's, it's almost impossible to measure, is it not? Uh, there's an integrated system. It's the IMF, the World Bank, um, the agreements to maintain the regime in Saudi Arabia, and the petrodollar. It's all integrated. And then you find that some of the Middle East countries uh, actually try to sort of break free by having their own independent uh, central uh, bank. They include um, Iraq, Syria, Libya, I Iran. Now, that in itself then becomes a challenge and it takes the form, for example, of saying, well, we're not going to sell our oil. Is this, not, this is the most dangerous thing that any leader in the world could endeavor to do, is to nationalize the bank and ultimately have a system which is not within the grip. If you nationalize your bank, or you're a, a genuinely independent, not like the UK Bank of England, right. you are, that is the crux of the matter of breaking free and finding your own destiny. You have to do several steps further on that. Mm -hmm. But just sticking at the moment, just saying, I have an independent uh, central bank, those countries in the Middle East have all ended up being attacked or threatened with attack. Okay, and so if you do nationalize your bank, step number one, what are the other essential steps for a nation to be truly sovereign? Yes, uh, you, 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 you nationalize your money supply and you then ins insist that it is in fact interest free when it's used for the real economy. You let the ordinary banks continue lending money at interest, uh, but you use it for the real economy and for the spreading of the real economy and that's the essence of the matter. So it's that simple, really, and yet that's the most dangerous thing that can be done. And, and when we get back, I want to talk a little bit more about the pattern of imperial powder, power and who we target. And uh, let's discuss in detail whether or not uh, what we're being told and the real motives behind it are anywhere remotely close to each other. Who's been cousins, who's been deceived... Uh, by those who use the shibboleths and, and the slogans of democracy. True democracy is an economic democracy. Mm. It's really what the American dream used to be about. And long ago, the American dream was sold down the drain. It doesn't exist anymore. But people who want to go forward, and the people's voice is going forward, and it's seeing that the whole of the thinking and the whole of the structures are false, that a new thinking is required, and the center of it is the willingness to challenge on the global financial system and to demand, quite simply, to start, that your own government use its central bank for an interest-free loan or maybe for a bridge. Just do that. Just do that one thing and immediately you can start to unlock all the deceits and the inefficiencies and the injustices. And, and when, we, when we look at this, actually, uh, while it's an amazingly powerful system of tyranny that has worked effectively for quite some time, hundreds of years, really, it's also a very fragile system because as people become more aware of it, 
ultimately, there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that we're all going to realize we're fighting the same thing. Literally, the financial system is the head of the snake, the main form of control and power in this world. Every single nation on this planet, if it were to have its own bank and its own financing system, non-usury based, done in a transparent, intelligent way, would be able to have a world-class infrastructure, world-class education, health care. They would be able to have a standard of living that would be even above what we've enjoyed in the West simply by having a transparent form of monetary supply. Is this not correct? Am I wrong? Is you this put wrong? it absolutely magnificently and, and, and shortly and uh, uh, expressively in a way perhaps I, I, I couldn't. I thank you for that. That's perfectly true because you see of all the lies you're being told one of them is is that you live in a free market which is efficient. It isn't free, all right. It is inefficient and it is and what can be done is that when you spread the real economy you're actually creating social and economic justice and making producers and consumers the same people and when you do that you get the efficiency and you get the justice at the same time. Now that is actually the opposite to finance capitalists and mainstream neoclassical thinking. They think that justice and efficiency are incompatible. Mm -hmm. But that's because they have massive contradictions, they've screwed the thing up for the benefit of the narrow elite. You've got to start becoming democratic. And when you really go for a true democracy, spreading it over time, right? And ensuring that people build their productive capacity individually. You, and yes, you can use uh, the money supply, for example, to generate electricity cleanly in this country. We could generate 10% of our electricity. And, and when we look at entire like that. nations that are indebted, enslaved, quite frankly, um, and we look at ourselves, here we are in the West, you know, we're talking about people who've worked their whole lives, uh, we're talking about people who've done everything they were supposed to, pay their taxes, and their children or grandchildren can't afford university, but even if they can't afford university, the one thing they're guaranteed of is debt, but they ain't guaranteed a job. Apparently, we're being told that we haven't worked hard enough, that we're in debt, <laughs> that ultimately we're in debt. Not only uh, are we in debt, but that we owe this money to the richest of the rich, those who our treasonous governments have empowered with the ability to issue money, debt-based money, we owe them. And we have been conned to the point that we have now paid out trillions, trillions of dollars. And these same banks have had the nerve and the audacity this is to pay incredible bonuses and continue to reap massive rewards. And we're tolerating this. We have the same problem <laughs> that the people of the Middle East and all these so-called third world nations that are in indebted uh, by these same bankers, we have the same cause. And, and this is, you know, the connection of the Middle East, how the Middle East is suffering under this system. So are we in the West. So are we. And we're, we're experiencing now a sort of shift from the West to the East, are we not? All that power and comfort and that we've been grown accustomed to in the West is fast dissipating to the point where if we continue to bury our heads in the sand, especially the American people that have enjoyed this horrendous global currency dollar system, they're going to end up being a third world nation very quickly, aren't they, unless we get our, ourselves straight? Yes, yes, you're quite right that the whole system is, is the Middle East and in the West. It's ultimately, it is ultimately about the control at the top and the sucking up of wealth. Um, and uh, it does not take account of the, all the time the physical realities are there. The farms are there, the factories are there, the people who want to work are there. Yes. But you've got a financial system which claiming to be efficient, claiming to be democratic, doesn't use the fact doesn't use the farms, isn't the just sucks up well. The value of the money is, is, is on, the, on the work ethic, uh, on, on the people, is it not? That's where every country, tell me the vast majority of people around the world would not take a, a livable wage to do a, a decent job and work hard at it. Most people, if they could work uh, a, in, a, in a dignified way and have enough money to take uh, good care of their family, put a roof over their head, food on the table, and have time to relax and enjoy their family, most people would kill for such a thing. They're struggling just to survive. The value of each nation's currency would be based on the work of the people, it, would it not? It would be, uh, it'd be based purely on what physically, the, the fight they have with nature to uh, produce things and provide services, it would be based upon what they do within, within their own 
uh, our countries. Uh, but you're quite right. People, um, I mean, they try and go in open boats across oceans to try and get a, a job or some sort of standard of living in their lives. All the resources are there. The human desire is there. And indeed, there is a thing called a financial system which you can use for these particular aims. But it's blocked at the highest level. In Europe, it is blocked by treaty. The Maastricht Treaty actually blocks this proposal. And that's one of the reasons why, if you're going to go forward in the UK with this, you're going to actually have to at least say, well, we're going to alter or get out of the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, so the finance system of capitalism is locked into the treaties, it's locked into the teaching of the universities in the Middle East. All the Islamic economics, they've been trained in the West, and they end up essentially selling out the interests of the bulk of the, uh, of the population. So if the Maastricht Treaty basically mandates this financial system, oh, yeah. the only way to remove ourselves from that is either to change uh, or, or eliminate the Maastricht uh, District Agreement, or at least that aspect of or to get out of the EU. Is that correct? Well, th that would be the easiest way of doing it. In theory, you could basically get the pressure to change uh, the, the European Union, if you want to. But we are outside of the Euro, but we're not outside of the Maastricht Treaty. Right. Um, but the, the bottom line in all this, there has to be a willingness, for your, uh, take your own words, to go for the head of the snake. And that means we have to say, we, we demand the issuance of 10 million quid uh, for some simple uh, project, maybe a bridge or, or a railway or a hospital or for a school, and just in that public sector, and as soon as you do that, you open the principle which you can use the interest-free supply, the money to go out mm -hmm. and to be paid back and cancelled, leaving the bridge behind. And you can do that for the benefit of a small business, which are not getting any money at the moment. You can do it to spread ownership. You can do it to, to introduce a clean electricity generation. In the UK, there are all sorts of places where you can have clean electricity. But as soon as you use interest-bearing money, by the time you've built the project, the sum has built up to be unrepayable. Yes. So if you're prepared to challenge at the top of the snake, and the lovely thing about the people's voice is that it sees the connections right the way across the board, and economics is not separate from anything else. Absolutely not. In its everything. practices, it goes, and assumptions, it all connects with everything else. And so we have to join in on the people's voice and say we're going to challenge in all the aspects with new paradigm thinking right the way across the board. Absolutely, and, and, and one of the main methods of control, aside from ignorance, which is, you know, if, if you're ignorant, if you don't even know the problem, then how are you going to solve the problem? Another of the primary methods of, of, of maintaining tyranny is fear. The yeah. biggest fear-based uh, tactic, they did this with Ireland, they've done it with Greece, they're doing it with Spain, uh, is if you get out of the EU system, out of the Euro, you know, it's going to be chaos, your, your economy will turn to a shambles, and I don't think anyone will disagree that any, any government that actually pulls out of that system is going to experience difficulty at, at, at best. It's going to be a trying period, but ultimately, the idea that we have to remain locked in this system in order to avoid financial chaos is, a, is, a, is an incredible lie. It's a fear-based lie intended to keep us locked in this system, which is, in fact, our own enslavement. Uh, Greece, the uh, government debt ratio to um, GDP was 120, and then it's now risen to 170. Anything over 100 is unrepayable. The system is simply going to fail. Iceland is not in, and it's independent and it has taken independent actions, and it is Iceland that is giving us the lead. It doesn't quite know how to do it all and use its national bank. It's still sort of half in, in, in the finance capitalism. But it has to be in the first place to be stand up and say, we will not pay the debt, which is an odious debt which has been falsely incurred, and we will not listen to the strictures of the IMF. You see, all these things are connected. Uh, connected. Iceland is giving us an example. But we have to be brave enough to say, we, uh, in the UK, we should demand of the Bank of England. We should simply demand that they, there's nothing new in this. How do you think the West got out of its troubles in the 1930s? New Zealand, Australia, Canada, even France, they all used the mechanism which I've just been referring to. And it got them out of trouble. But in no time, in, in some committee late at night, 
the bankers got back and they said, oh, you can't use your own national bank, you must only borrow from us. T tell me this, Rodney, Th this to me is just mind-boggling. The audacity, uh, the arrogance of the bankers, the same individuals that run this tyrannical system, demanding of their puppets in government that we, the people, are extracted of even but more money, bailing them out to the tune of trillions. Ken, there are lies which they use. One of them is, is that the banking system is at the heart of the free market and <laughs> responsible for its success. Well, point number one, the success is not a success, it's a failure. But they say... Well, well, it's a success if you look at it from the tyrant's point from of the view. Tyrant's, <laughs> from the tyrant's po point of view. Uh, but th they, they think they are the only thing that matters. They think um, a nurse is not valuable, a farmer isn't valuable, that the sun, which actually <laughs> isn't valuable... They, and you get this in mainstream economics. It's, the banking system is the only thing which creates it all, etc. <laughs> a bank is part of the system. It is the uh, people and the capital instruments, which include the sun and the, and the weather, but you can't own them, right? These are the things which do it. But it is, they've been conned, and they got away with it, Ken, essentially because of the fall of communism. Um, if I may say so, mm. um, events in your life, events in... Uh, David's life and events in my own life, a lot of them come around about 1990 and, and the, the reason was is that communists fell, communism fell and then the issue was, and deep down inside us we were saying to ourselves, well has the world become perfected or are we faced with another disaster? And it was that recognition which I think would have been a big um, impulse in, with David Icke in his period at that particular time and may have been the case with you because it is the arrogance which you're, you're, you're hitting on at the moment, but it's embodied in, in, embodied in the teaching in the universities and in the universities in the Islamic uh, economics of, of, of the Middle East. We have to challenge it. We do not have a perfect system. The snake of the head is this corrupt financial system, and it has no concern for you or the viewers of this program. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I, I, when I look at it, I really have to sort of laugh at myself. I see us as human beings as our own con the constructors of our own prison. You know, we, we have built this prison. We're the, we're the ones that give this, pre this prison any credence at all. This prison can be torn down tomorrow if we want to. But we have mm. to. No one is more hopelessly enslaved than the one who falsely believes he is free. And this is the greatest con of all, is that they've got us to accept the idea that we should be working 40 hours a week just to scrape by and, and struggle to keep a roof over our head. That's not living. That is a wage slave. And that is what we've become. And we've come to accept that as the reality of life, like death and taxes, as unavoidable. And it's not true at all. The truth of the matter is that we are operating under a system of scarcity which is engineered specifically to get us, the masses, to fight for the crumbs while the tyrants sit at a table that is as lavish as lavish gets, where money is no object, they can buy anything and anyone that can be bought, and yet we, as they scrape the crumbs off the table, sit here and fight each other to be able to grab these crumbs. And we fail to see that at the top of the pyramid is a bunch of tyrants laughing at us while we sit here and cut each other's throats for the crumbs. Yes, it doesn't have to be this, this way. This house of cards can all come tumbling uh, down. And we only have to just at attack a few things. But don't forget, they have spying on their side and they have debt. And they're going to use this on every single person to try to maintain their power. Well, with that, we're going to bring Chris Coverdale. We're going to talk about taxes and how that relates to the financial system. And that is a subject I Chris really Cardale. can't wait to discuss. Welcome back to the Middle East Show. I'll tell you what, you know, I, I really am much more of an activist than I am a journalist. There's really no point to doing a television program, as far as I'm concerned, unless there's some actionable uh, course that we can take to change the world for the better. And I'll tell you what, this gentleman here is a man after my own heart, a, a kindred spirit if ever there was one, because I simply reached a point in my life where I understood that paying taxes was effectively like paying a hitman. 
uh, you're paying for murder. And if you're paying for murder, it makes you just as culpable in the murder. And for us to ignore the fact that our taxes are being used to commit mass murder, state-sponsored terrorism, war crimes, crimes against humanity, I don't know. It's just illogical. We're ignoring the reality. And so I reached a point, like this gentleman here, Mr. Chris Coverdale, where I simply said, I cannot, in good conscience, pay for the murder of my brother or sister. And so, Chris, I really want to welcome you very warmly to the show. This subject is so important to me. It's fitting. It could have been on the first show. It ends up being the second show. But it shows how high on the list of priorities it is for me. Thank you for Thank coming you. here. Um, most people equate not paying taxes with the breakdown of society uh, and ultimately chaos and anarchy and stuff like this. So let me just say one thing first, and then I want to get into the lawful way of not paying taxes. This is a fallacy and a great manipulation to start off, isn't it? Because actually the vast majority of our taxes, if not virtually all of it, is going to pay the debt uh, on the interest that we pay to private bankers. So in a way, the best argument our opponents might have is that our taxes are actually not funding war as much as they're paying back the debt. That being said, let's not get caught up on that detail. That's a whole other subject that we're going to get right. into in great depth. At the end of the day, our taxes are going to pay for policies of war. Tell me why people should consider not uh, paying their taxes. Well, uh, the simple answer is that it is unlawful. Since the Second World War, when Germany's leaders were convicted of uh, waging 11 wars of aggression um, in contravention of the Kellogg-Briand Pact, it has been a criminal offence to commit war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and to wage war. Is it, is it safe to say that that was signed because the people of the world were at a point where they demanded that there be a mechanism to prevent further world wars? Is that a fairly safe... Yes, I and mean, basically, um, after the First World War, the Calabrian Pact was signed, renouncing war as an instrument of national policy. Um, and when Germany breached that in um, 1939 and invaded and occupied 11 nation states, they were held to account, the leaders of Germany were held to account at Nuremberg for what they had done and for the deaths and injuries and the destruction that they had brought about in that period of the Second World War. And it, they claimed that they were only following orders of their government, Hitler and his uh, cronies. And the judges said, no, that's not good enough. There comes a time when you have a responsibility to humankind, to international law, that overrides your duty to national domestic laws and the orders of your government. And so if they give you an order, you have a legal duty to refuse to obey that order. Well, if this, it breaches international law. And I think this is a really important issue because for me, whether it is lawful or unlawful to not pay taxes doesn't matter. If someone would have given me an order in the Marine Corps, uh, you know, as an ex-Marine in a combat environment, if somebody would have given me an order to, to kill a child or to do something like that, I certainly would like to think that I would have defied the order because it's simply immoral. And yet, we don't look at it as that cut and dry when we pay our taxes. But in effect, that dead child or that destroyed family's life is because we pay that tax. We are, in fact, criminals ourselves. Just like the hitman scenario, if you pay a hitman to commit murder, are you not as guilty as the hitman? And that is essentially what we're doing, are we not? Absolutely. I couldn't put it better. That's precisely what we are doing. If we pay tax, any tax at all, income tax, VAT, council tax, or whatever it is, to our government, they use part of it to murder Afghans, Iraqis, Libyans, Syrians, Pakistanis, whoever then that is a criminal offence of accessory to mass murder and to a number of other crimes associated with war. And in particular, crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. And anyone, since 1998, when we signed the Rome Statute, anyone who commits a crime of ancillary, conduct ancillary to genocide, conduct ancillary to crimes against humanity, or conduct ancillary to war crimes, commits the worst criminal offence it is possible to commit. So it has been, particularly in this country, since 2001, September the 1st, 2001, a crime to aid and abet 
genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. And that's what one does when one pays tax. And so this is really the interesting point in history we've reached now because I would argue that my birth nation, the United States, has done nothing but commit war crimes incessantly since World War II and in World War II, especially Hiroshima, Nagasaki, the firebombing of Dresden, you know, what we did in other parts of, of uh, in, in Europe. Incredible crime after crime after crime, but we've now reached a point where I think finally we as people are starting to realize that guess what we're not actually the good guys we have been conned for a long time and I think it, it was still very much there when we invaded Afghanistan and we invaded Iraq even to a maybe lesser degree but a lot of people believe that well no we, we're gonna take care of these bad people and we are the good guys even though we make mistakes we're better than they are so you know it's better that we go in and, and we could justify it in our minds somehow but I think hopefully We've reached a point now where we realize, no, we're not the good guys. And the reasons why we carry out these wars is basically ba based on a pack of lies. And we do, in fact, commit horrendous crimes against humanity. And I think as a soldier, as an ex-Marine myself, I can tell people that it doesn't matter what side you're on. In war, horrendous things happen. And the, the crime of aggression, that is the crime that we're guilty of. We have initiated aggressions that have resulted in mass murder. And is the veil finally lifted, do you think? Is there any intelligent reason to debate whether or not we are on the right side of history for what we've done? Um, the answer to that is no. There is no rational way in which we can say warfare and the use of armed force is lawful, is right, is the morally correct thing to do. There is no way that has happened. And really the issue is that since the Second World War, Britain and America have been deceived by their lawyers by government lawyers into believing that like, this is lawful. Like Barack Obama, who happens to be a constitutional lawyer. As wow, was it's... Tony Blair and <laughs> Jack Straw and Jeff Hoon and Lord Goldsmith, who all said that the war would be lawful. That was false and a lie and an error in law, and it has never been. And my problem is that uh, in 1970, the United Nations, having been uh, for really angered at the, the way in which um, the US and Britain and others were breaking international law, came out with what I think is the most important legal declaration ever made. It's the, called the Declaration on Principles of International Law. And it says absolutely clearly that it is a crime to interfere in another state's affairs. And that document, which is so important is never been made public to the rest of the world and yet it is the single most important legal document and legal advice ever produced we must ensure that people know what it says well and so this this brings me to the point that i want for my brothers and sisters in the west to face for those out there who will say, no, no, we're still on the right side, no, no, we can carry, okay, whatever, there's really not a whole lot you can say to that person. But for the rest of us who've maintained some semblance of sanity and intelligence, we know at this point that we are acting in a criminal way. What can we do to stop paying for the mass murder of our brothers and sisters halfway around the world? What can we do? I think there's uh, four or five things that we can do straight away. First of all, you need to sign make up your own mind as to why you are refusing to pay tax. If you can identify which laws are being broken, you have then the law on your side. And uh, we'll make sure that it's put up on the website so that people know what those laws are. What's your website? Um, I've just changed it, so we'll have to put it up on yours. Okay. It okay. was Make Wars History, but that was taken down. Okay. Um, the the important issue is that when you pay tax, you do it on the assumption that your government is using the money lawfully. And you th therefore say, right, now as a human being, I have decided to withdraw my consent to being taxed when it is used for unlawful purposes. You have conned me uh, into paying tax saying that it is for the defense of the country when in fact you are using it for aggression as you say rather than defense 
There is nothing defensive about anything we've done in the last 60, 70 years. To the contrary, if, if we wanted to recruit more terrorists in the world, this would probably be the best policy of all, to go and invade Absolutely. and occupy, enrage them, kill their children, kill their family members. If anything could recruit so-called terrorists, I imagine that would be the best way to do it. That's, that's what we've done. another way that's very important, is that the world signed up to um, an international agreement not to fund terrorism. Now, when you look at the detail of that law, everything that our government is doing is terrorism in uh, overseas. And we have an obligation, in fact, a lawful duty, not to fund terrorism. So under the Terrorism Act in the United Kingdom, under Articles 15 and 17 of the 2000 Act, it is a criminal offence to fund terrorism. So every penny we pay in VAT, council tax, income tax, and all the other taxes and fines and other ways in which we give money over to the government. Every penny is a criminal offence under the Terrorism Act. It is also a criminal offence under the International Criminal Court Act because it is conduct ancillary to crimes against humanity, war crimes and genocide. And just knowing these facts should give people enough understanding and confidence to say no. Under no circumstances will I uh, carry on funding these criminal activities of our government, and I refuse to do so. And, you know, when I look at current events and I see the evolution of the world that I live in, I have to say I'm, I'm tremendously optimistic, keeping in sight of the fact that this is a very dangerous time. We have very powerful interests at the top of a power pyramid that want a third world war and have tried to instigate it uh, with Iran for most of the last several years. But in Syria, I think something so incredible has happened and I, I really hope people take note of that. And that is that with all of the propaganda and the agenda to escalate things in Syria, which of course was nothing but a stepping stone to Iran having a mutual yes. defense pact, there was a, a, a concerted effort to foster this uh, attack on Syria and it didn't happen. This is the first time in history that I'm aware of that we as people actually dictated policy and I, I'm firmly I'm a firm believer that the reason why the parliament did not vote to escalate in Syria and why the US Congress which is the most treasonous body of government on the planet couldn't even go to a vote on it was because there was no support for it none people did not buy it despite all the propaganda and the fact is that these governments which are nothing more than puppets for the puppet masters the tyrants could not vote for this and it's because we did not provide them any consent and that brings me to taxes if we refuse to pay these taxes the wars of aggression and the mass murder, the crimes against humanity would stop in their tracks. Yes. That makes us guilty. And it may not be the easiest thing to confront, but we are guilty. It has been done in our name with our money, and we are complicit. And it's Correct. a lie, if I may finish off on this point, it's a lie to say that if we stop paying our taxes, that society will fall apart. Because as we discussed with Rodney in the last segment, and as we will discuss in the next one, actually, most of that money is going to pay off the interest, the debt which we don't have to pay in the first place. So we could have world-class infrastructure, we could take care of our family, best education, health care, around the world, and not pay these taxes, and not commit mass murder. Am I wrong here in this, Chris, or that's, is this correct? That's absolutely correct. Straight down the line, you do not need to pay taxes, and there are several ways in which you can make sure that they are used for your lawful purposes. And one is to, for instance, set up a trust where you pay the money into a trust for the benefit of the uh, government um, on the grounds that they cannot get hold of it until they act lawfully. That's pretty reasonable, isn't That's, it? That's uh, very simple, straightforward. Now, you, you're actually admitting that you are paying tax. So for some people, refusing to pay tax at all is the way through. If you're 
concerned about that, you can then put it into a trust which cannot be accessed by a government until they act lawfully. And let, let me say this too. I mean, I think that's a noble thing. I, spe I especially think that, that we, we should look after our fellow human beings. I'm not convinced at all that we need to pay anything remotely close in tax or even any tax at all if we had a truly sane and just transparent system. But let us just say, and let us just acknowledge that, okay, we pay taxes. I would be happy to pay a tax into a tax. Happy to pay into a tax that ensures that human society has a dignified existence. No problem with that at all. But if even one penny goes towards murdering a brother or sister, that's simply not acceptable. Correct. And and it's but it's not a choice between one or the other. Either chaos and anarchy or uh, support the system and and keep society functioning and also kill people in mass. I'll tell you what, Chris, we're going to talk about this more. We're going to bring uh, Rodney back, and we're going to talk about how the tax system that we're paying into and the financial system, how these things work together and how ultimately they really end up in enslaving us and, and even further, our children looking more and more like they have no future under this system. Excellent. Welcome back to the Middle East Show. I've got my guest Chris Coverdale and we're bringing back uh, Rodney Shakespeare so we can tie in the tax system and the financial system because they both work together quite nicely. But first let's take a look at this quote from our good friend Alexander Haig, the former Secretary of State of the United States and a former general as well. I think he said it quite nicely when he said, let them march all they want as long as they pay their taxes. Chris, is that a, a pretty revealing statement or what? It sums it all up. Basically, you can't wage war unless you have the taxes coming in from all the people. If you have no money, you cannot commit the war crimes. So is he saying that we can't stop war by marching and protesting? Would that be a fair statement? Uh, marching, protesting and demonstrating really has no effect whatsoever on government policies. Well, the clearly... only thing that will affect them is if you stop the money that pays for the war. Well, I suppose the protests in 2003, the largest protests in the history of the world, make pretty clear that uh, we don't stop war by protesting. I remember, actually, yeah. back in that time, I initiated something called the Human Shield Action to Iraq because I knew that these protests were not going to stop this, and I also knew the end result for Iraq was going to be an absolute disaster, and it angered me that people were deluding themselves into thinking that we could stop this. And I think it was always more about feeling good about yourself, salving your conscience, than it was about actually truly wanting to stop war. And I'm hoping, 10 years later, that it's not that way today, that we actually want to stop war for good. What do you think, Rodney? <laughs> Well, yes, um, there's a sort of spectrum of people and a, a lot of people do essentially want to do a little bit and, and, and to feel good. But the situation is hardening. Uh, it's hardening in respect of the debt and the financial system. And the, the crimes are being increasingly exposed. Uh, congratulations to Malaysia for stopping Tony Blair ever going there uh, in yeah. the future. And uh, so, yes, um, the situation is now changing. We do need some more effective action. Well, that leads me right to the next point that I want to bring Chris on, and that is that if we want to talk about effective change, things that truly, truly change the course of history, what is the primary way to do that historically? Um, tax rebellion really has underpinned just about every major international change, every revolution. And it goes back to, for instance, in 1215, King John wanted to wage war in Aquitaine. And the barons said, no, you, we will not give you the troops and the money unless you agree to our demands. Those demands later became Magna Carta. It was a fundamental change in Britain. It's the same with uh, the American Revolution. That started because of the refusal of the Americans, colonies at that time, to pay taxes to the British government without representation in Parliament. And the tea tax and all the other things started the American Revolution. And we see, actually, if we look to America in the recent past with the Tea Party, which I would argue, and I think most people would, who have intelligently looked at this, was infiltrated rather quickly because the ideal of the Tea Party is absolutely correct. We're paying into a tax system that is so corrupted that you have a man in Barack Obama, a constitutional lawyer of all things, 
who has appointed himself dictatorial powers to the point that he can execute anyone, anywhere, no trial, no jury, no conviction, and including American citizens. And if that isn't the definition of tyranny, I don't know what is. And yet, the American people, dumbed down or complacent or whatever it is, are allowing this. And you had a Tea Party that really, that was sort of the core. And something happened to it along the way, I think, and tell me if you think I'm wrong, I think the powers that be are deathly afraid that people will actually instigate a tax revol revulsion and uh, a tax rebellion. And I think they knew they had to stop this quickly and turn it into something it's not. Do you, do you think that's the case? I think that's absolutely the case. Uh, they are keen to encourage us to stand up and march, demonstrate, and protest because they know they don't have to change anything if we do that. So now we must take a different course of action. And I think the two ways of doing it are through the law courts and by ta refusing to pay tax. And for the first time in history, it is a criminal offense to pay tax when a government uses the money to wage or for unlawful purposes, such as waging war or committing war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Which, I, ironically, if we were to talk about war, the, the nations that are involved in lawful war <laughs> would actually be Afghanistan and Iraq, and, and Pakistan would also have a right to fight back. But the, the world upside down that we live in appoints us in the West somehow the right to conduct wars of aggression, which in terms of international law is actually the supreme crime. Because once you yes. initiate a war, it's inevitable that war crimes will be committed on all sides. I, I think people really delude themselves if they think that the British soldiers or the American soldiers or Israel, for instance, the most moral army in the world. This is ridiculous. If you're involved in a war, I don't care. Even if you're on the right side, crimes will be committed. Children will be killed. Women will be killed. Uh, people will be raped. Uh, there will be mass murders. There will be cover-ups. All of this stuff is going to occur. It's inherent in war. So the real crime the major crime is to start it in the first place. And that's what we do. Yes. And ironically, we call Iraqis and Afghanis terrorists for defending their homeland as if we wouldn't do the same exact thing if it was our nation being invaded by a nation from halfway around the world. Correct. It's upside down, isn't it? Totally. And we have to do something about it. And I think the best thing to do is to take nonviolent action and refuse to pay your taxes. I think so as well. And I think. When we look at the financial system and how it blends together, with the ta they, they both rely on each other. I mean, the tax system is so intrinsic in the financial fraud. And, and even though, as I've stated earlier, the vast majority of our money is going to actually pay off debt to bankers, private bankers, that we don't have to pay, we could default on that tomorrow. Yet we haven't thus far. So we have this option. We could not pay our taxes, and we could also say, could we not, Rodney? No, we don't owe you anything. If anything, you, the bankers, owe us big time. I would even take it a step further to say that these bankers shall consider themselves lucky if they're not hanging from lampposts once people realize the magnitude of the crime that has been committed against the people and the amount of death and suffering that has come from the system of financial enslavement that is the banking system today. I, I'm, that's, those are strong words I know, but uh, <laughs> is this not fair to say? Can we actually calculate the amount of suffering that comes from this system? Uh, You've put it uh, very uh, precisely. Um, your, your only problem is you can't actually calculate the amount of suffering. It's on such a large scale and it takes many, so many forms. Uh, but the heart of that matter is the creation of the money out of nothing. And that wouldn't be a bad thing if it was then used for the democratic purpose of spreading the real economy, but it's used for the purpose of that narrow elite which is sucking up wealth in terms of wealth and interest and money, at the same time he's doing it with a psychological control and is elevating the population, ultimately for the purposes of power. One has to identify what is the heart, the head of the snake, and go at it. And it really is the financial system, of which taxation, as you're pointing out, Chris here is pointing out, uh, you, you are essentially paying tax to pay interest so it gets but it goes up into the hands of the one that one percent. You've got to go for it and challenge it and say you will not tolerate this anymore.
I, I think, you know, yes, we're reaching that point. Uh, hopefully we're hitting that point of critical mass, a tipping point where people are realizing that there is simply no way to have a just and peaceful world as long as we have a financial the system such as this. critical mass is getting towards that 10% when it does, and that's when things really start to change. When 10% really clearly wake up, that's the point at which you can turn around politics. It's starting to get there. And, you know, I want for us to imagine, especially the viewers to imagine, that, you know, while this appears to be largely doom and gloom, and there's so much horror that comes from this, we are on the verge, potentially, of a world that won't resemble the one we live in now. The world that can become a reality for us once we break free from the financial enslavement that is inherent in the current system. We can have prosperity around the world. African people who've been starving, literally 30,000 plus a day starving to death, that could be wiped out tomorrow. We can end that tomorrow. We can solve every single problem we have if we cut the head off the snake. And every single aspect of human society that we can think of, whether it's the mainstream media, whether it's the governments, which are mostly completely prostitutes, uh, puppets, whether it's the educational system, which is really indoctrination, the major energy companies, all of that is controlled under the financial system. So there is one thing that stands in our way of liberating ourselves. And, and really, it starts with what's best for me not being the issue, but what is best. Stop looking at it from the perspective of, well, what's best for me? Well, I need to pay the taxes because I don't want to put myself, put my head above the parapet. But it's not like that, is it? Because we are, as you've just said, it is actually a criminal offense at this point. And let's just be clear, let's explain that to people. It is a criminal offense to pay taxes in the UK based on UK law. So let's explain that one more time for people so you get this. Right. Basically, in 2001, Britain passed the International Criminal Court Act. Now, it should have been called the War Crimes, Crimes Against Humanity and Genocide Act, because those are the criminal offences included in that legislation. And additionally, they included the offence of conduct ancillary to genocide, conduct ancillary to war crimes, and conduct ancillary to crimes against humanity. And those three offences, which are ba basically aiding and abetting anything yeah. that you do, to bring about those crimes so if, is a if crime it's itself. knowingly aiding and abetting, isn't it? That's no, the crunch. So we, we've reached the point now where this is why the people's voice exists, quite frankly, because if we're not willing to face the truth, how are we going to solve our problems? And the truth of the matter is that it cannot be disputed. When we pay money into a tax system, a portion of that money is allocated to a defense budget, which isn't a defense budget at all. It's an offensive uh, Offense. budget. Exactly. It's a military industrial complex budget, which is used to basically commit mass murder. Yes. It, those who want to deny that are living in a delusion. They're like the ostrich burying their head in the sand. This is the connection between us, the people on the street, and the dead children in Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan and so many other places in the world. Understanding this, this is the beauty of what we find ourselves with today, isn't it? Is that Absolutely. it's not illegal, actually. I will be the first one to say that even if it was illegal, if uh, a Nazi commander ordered a troop to carry out an unlawful act, then it would have been the right thing to do for many of these uh, Nazis to say, no, I will not carry out that order. And that didn't happen, did it? And how are we any different when we know that our government is committing these horrendous acts and yet we're paying knowingly for this? This is the truth that if we face it square on, we're going to change things, aren't we? Absolutely. Um, all we need to do is to work together to get hundreds and thousands of us together refusing to pay tax until our governments act lawfully under international law. Well, I think that's exactly what we're going to do with this show now, isn't it? Now, I don't know how long it'll be before Ofcom or any other uh, stool, you know, stool pigeons for the system of power decide to try and come in and stop us from transmitting these types of thoughts, because this is the kind of thing that is never discussed in the mainstream media. The only people that have discussed this are those people courageous enough and independent enough to be able to broadcast such things on YouTube and yep. smaller scale. We're now reaching a larger audience, which is really forcing the issue upon the people, whether they want to see it, whether they want to acknowledge it or not. We've reached a point now where it is up to us. 
If we want to allow in the nuclear age a continuance of the system that we've allowed for many decades now, I believe we're heading straight towards the self-destructive path of collective suicide. We cannot sustain this path much longer. It is now upon us, this generation, not the next one, to stop this. And the best way, I would say, is what we're talking about right now is to lawfully, lawfully stop paying taxes. Uh, on Ofcom, it's supposed to uphold the balance in the presentation of matters on in broadcasting, but Ofcom in practice upholds imbalance and it does not allow what is millions of people coming forward with a different uh, view. So yes, Ofcom may well try to involve itself in the situation, but the bottom line is who is standing for balance, who is standing for the two sides, and Ofcom generally represents just one side in this matter. And it would be an outrage that Ofcom should in any way intervene when people here are standing uh, for peace and are standing for a decency in this world. And Ofcom had better just address its mind to this particular thought. What, well, at the end of the day, does it stand for? Well, Ofcom is comprised of people. And people within Ofcom have families. They also have children. And I think this is where many people, in places that you would otherwise never suspect of actually having a conscience, even the CIA and Mossad, people in, you know, who rubber stamp policies of war, have said, for instance, that an attack on Iran is unjustified because there is no actual evidence of a weaponized nuclear program and furthermore that it would be crazy. And I think this is what's happening with people around the world is we're realizing that this path that we're on is not sustainable. It's incredibly dangerous and could end the world as we know it. So how are we going to solve this problem? Are we going to delude ourselves into thinking that we can march our way and protest our way into a better world? Are we actually going to be serious and do things that actually have the promise to change this world for the better and hopefully be responsible parents and hand our children some sort of future? I don't know if we're going to manage to reach that challenge and, and surpass it, but I think this discussion is going a long way to actually well, getting It's not there. just about war, it's also about the spying in which they are now attempting to control us uh, and almost completely, not only in the financial system, uh, everything we buy and sell will be done on cards which they can withdraw, that's the next game they're going to be up to. We, we, we've we reached have a to point. stand up against these things. We've reached a point where enough is enough. Every, t you know, timing is everything and I hope and I pray that this is the time for all of us to confront these facts and do what we need to do. I want to thank you so deeply my brother Rodney and also my brother Chris the subject that we talked about today, I hope, somehow spreads and grows because there ain't no doubt in my mind whatsoever that we can affect a better world if we're truly serious. And with that, I thank you thank all you. for watching and we're going to move on to our next segment. I want to thank Chris and Rodney once again. That is a subject that I really hope takes fire. I hope that people out there in the audience decide it's time to call into the studio. It's time to get a hold of Chris Coverdale. It's time to say in unison together publicly, we will not pay for the murder of our brothers and sisters around the world. Going on to the next subject, uh, we have the series Life in Gaza. This will be our second story. This is about the Lou family. And the whole point of the Life in Gaza series for me was to educate people about the insidious nature of aid and how aid actually is, is a massive uh, means to influence and uh, subdue and subvert the interests of the people from within. And ultimately, there's no way that the people of Gaza or the people of the world in Africa, they say the same things, that they can live a dignified life on aid. It is not the answer. Trade is a necessary step for the people of Gaza to be liberated. And that was really the whole point of this series. But with that being said, I'd like you to enjoy this story about the Lou family, a family who touched every one of us who was there and I believe will also touch you.
going today? Um, today we are going to Beit Hanun Shabbat camp. Um, this camp, um, the, the Israeli army um, in the war went to that place, destroyed so many homes, um, killing so many people. Many families lost their kids, um, three or four. Many families still live in tents till now. So it is a very big story because we're going to face so many things. Um, families lost members, um, homes um, that will collapse any minute and families are still, in, still live in it. Uh, families still live in tents after two years of war. Um, it is an area that full of many stories and, and many things to say about it. So we're here in uh, the Bat. The Bat. This is a, a part of Gaza that is known for, uh, well, the people, they never give up. That's what this area means. They, they won't leave, no matter how hard life gets, um, they stay. And uh, we're here to visit a family in a home, which we can see right here is not habitable by any reasonable sense, but it's the only place they have to live. There's still people living in tents in this area, but uh, here we are, life in Gaza. Welcome back to the show. Uh, this series, uh, Life in Gaza, we started last week with a story about the Samuni family 
And the feedback that I've heard, which is no surprise to me, is, is that people were deeply moved. And I know the, from all of us who were there on the day where we listened to Zainat Samouni talk about her experience and what happened, the execution of her husband and ultimately her four-year-old son, um, you know, this was an incredible experience. But it, it really is just one of so many experiences in Gaza. And, and the next story, uh, which we've just shown, the Lou family, is, is another incredible story. And when we did that story, myself and Noor, I remember going and visiting this family. And the one thing that really struck me, which is really uh, kind of uh, counter to what a lot of people think of when they think of Gaza, most people kind of think of, of a war zone and, you know, bombings and just the mayhem and all of that. And, and for sure, that is correct. There's a lot of that going on there. But amidst all of this, you have an incredible situation where children are running around just being kids, even though it's a war zone uh, oftentimes. And, and some of the, 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 you know, just the smiles and, and the kind of feedback that you get from the kids is really kind of mind-blowing given the circumstances they're living under. But, uh, but that was one of the things that really struck me about the Lou family. And fortunately for us, our correspondent in Gaza, uh, Noor Harazin, is, is going to give us an update on the Lou family. Uh, Noor, are you on the line? Hello, Ken. How are you doing, sister? I'm good. So I was just explaining that um, you've actually gone back and seen the Lou family in the last couple of weeks. Can you please tell us uh, what's, what's going on with the family now? Um, well, uh, late 2011, um, something like um, three years and a half after uh, their home was demolished in the war, um, the, the government, with the help of some charities, uh, foreigner charities, uh, I can't remember the names, but uh, they built new homes for uh, the families, the three families who were living inside that home. Um, so now the families, each family have their own small home that they are living in. <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, the home is empty. There's no furniture, there's no closets, there's no beds, uh, there's no TVs, heaters, nothing. They have a new home, but it's empty, and it's now for like one year and a half since uh, they are living in their new home. Well, th this would be something rather uh, amazing for us to contemplate in the West, you know, having a, a shell of a home with no uh, resources, no electricity. But uh, in Gaza, for a family like the Lou family, which is not all that unrepresentative of so many, um, they're in a much better state than they were because, uh, as the film shows, that home was uh, really uh, unsafe at best. And um, the, the kind of conditions that, that almost 30 members of one family, uh, family, three different family groups were living under was incredible. But they're doing a little bit better now, but of course, um, it could be a lot better as well. Of course, we hope that in the future, um, also these charities or even individuals from Gaza or internationals uh, would come up to help this family because for now it's something like seven years and they did not uh, watch TV or put their food in a refrigerator and they don't have ears and now it's winter. So we hope that in the near future their situation will be better. But of course, as you said, the home had no other choice during that time to live in that what we could even call it as a home. And when the new small homes were built for them, it was much better um, place to live in, even if it, if it was empty, even if they will have to sleep on the floors. Well, I, I, also from the first story we did about uh, Zainat Samouni uh, last, uh, in the last episode, we remember the, they were living on a dirt floor in the garage of, of one of the homes that wasn't destroyed. So, you know, they lived that way for, I think, also over three years before they finally got a, a, a proper home. And then I remember also the Awaja family, which is another story we're going to be showing on Life in Gaza uh, soon. They were living in a tent for, it was two years to that point. I don't know how much longer they lived there. Actually, they had just moved into a home. So this is, this is not any, uh, in any way uncharacteristic of the life for so many there, and we both know that. Uh, moving on to the, the current situation, uh, Noor, we've seen some incredible weather uh, occurring down in Gaza. Can you please tell us what's the latest with that? After the latest uh, storm that uh, hit Gaza uh, um, uh, last uh, Thursday, uh, there have been floats in Gaza. Uh, in some areas, the, the rain floats went up to five meters. 
some areas in Gaza and some of the camps also in Gaza, Shafiq camp, uh, Jubaria camp, uh, also in Rabat and Sanyuni. Uh, uh, today we got the news that four people died. Uh, few of them are children and please allow me to say their names because for us they are not only numbers. Um, yes. Wadda al Imawi, she's three years old. Malak al she's two years old. Lamif Fuju, she's three years old. And Hamza Lamour, he's 20 years old. The first three girls, the children, they arrived to the hospital frozen to death because uh, of the weather and because uh, the uh, power cut that went up to 20 hours per day in Gaza. If the girls and families with any source of heating. Uh, so this is a very bad news that uh, that we uh, got today. The four um, dead people, three of them are children. Also, there was 127 injuries uh, in Gaza. 1,183 families evacuated their homes because of the flood. Uh, they went to uh, some the Norwa schools that are close to their homes to spend the next few days uh, inside these um, classrooms at their new home until the weather gets better and the electricity get better, gets better and they can move back to, the, to, to their homes. Well, I've also read in uh, some reports this week that uh, a part of the flooding is due to Israel opening up some of their dams and actually, it's, so it's not just Mother Nature. Uh, Israel is increasing this, and it, it feels to me. And please tell me if I'm wrong about this. But I, I, having seen the act, the actions of Israel for so many years, they, they to me act like a spoilt brat child. When they when they when they don't get their way, they throw a tantrum. And generally, the way they throw a tantrum is by killing Palestinians or making their life more difficult. And this, I've seen this time and time again. And I know the Palestinians know this all too well. Is this the case? Did they actually open up dams um, and exacerbate the flooding for the people in Gaza? Yes, that's true. They opened something like five, and only uh, 30 minutes ago, they opened a sixth one uh, on Kuzaa area in Khan uh, And the civil defense went to help the people because uh, the flood went up uh, to even the second floor uh, of the people who are, who are living there. And, I, and I, as you mentioned, it's true, because if we look at it, it's all because of the responsibility of, of this occupation. Because the siege of, for seven years now left the Gazans with no full, no sources. They, it destroyed the economy. Even, even the civil defense, even the people who are working to help the people here, they don't have the materials to help them. They are using, the people are using boats, the fishing boats that we used to fish inside the sea. They are using this to evacuate the people uh, from their homes to the Onorwa well, this is, um, I, I, it, it still just shocks me. I, I've, I've, I've seen so many stories and, and, and really talked to so many people who have been through hell in Gaza, and yet it shocks me and it angers me to this day that this blockade continues. And, and it, it seems to me, you know, it, it's, it's gotten too easy to, to bash Israel. Israel is, is already alienating itself to the point where, you know, it, it isn't even attending Nelson Mandela's funeral. It's, it's, it seems like it's on a self-destruct mode, but I'm very concerned about what they will do uh, to the Palestinians while they're in complete self-destruct mode. But more important than what Israel does to me is, is the European Union, which will continue to do 28, 29 billion euros a year in trade with Israel, while it continues to do, thing like, do things like intentionally flood Gaza while it's already experiencing uh, uh, torrents of rain. Ultimately, why, is, why are we not charging Israel with the death of these four people um, I mean, maybe they would not have died had it not been for Israel opening up these dams. True, that's true. But if, if we, uh, like, when I shared this news with the people, we have this people who explain their views as that we t should take responsibility of ourselves. The, the um, ignorance uh, in, the, in the Western uh, countries are, is unbelievable, seriously, because they do not really realize that the Israeli occupation is, is, is the thing that causes these issues and this crisis. Well, you know, 
I, I do have hope that things will change in the near future. But when we get back, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the circumstances, a little bit more detail on the electrical situation in Gaza, and also touch on the fact that a lot of people don't realize, but as you mentioned, you can actually freeze to death in Gaza. You actually had some snow earlier this week as well, from what I understand. Yeah. So. And we got some breaking news, if you let me. Of course, of course, please. Uh, we just got the news that the Israeli occupation uh, close to the border in Khuzaaq and Yunus has opened fire and the ta tanks started shelling on the uh, uh, defense forces and uh, the Palestinian civilians who are trying to evacuate their homes uh, in that area after the Israeli occupation opened the water dams on them uh, 30 minutes ago. Well, no doubt that will be completely ignored by BBC, CNN, Fox News, and all the rest of the mainstream media, the prostitutes of propaganda. But, you know, as long as we're on air, we'll certainly do our best to make sure people are aware of such things. The, the thing that would be worth mentioning here is that Israel also, aside from throwing temper tantrums and killing Palestinians as a regular pattern, they also take advantage of uh, opportunities where people's attention is focused elsewhere to do these sorts of things. So while a lot of people are looking right now at the funeral of Nelson Mandela, it provides a lot of cover for Israel to do these sorts of things. So they can kill a few Palestinians and it won't even make any of the news. And basically these people, as you point out earlier, by you know, actually naming the victims uh, who've recently died in Gaza, they're actually people, there are family members whose lives are being destroyed, whose hearts are broken. Um, but for Israel, it's just an opportunity to actually do what they do best, it seems, and that is killing Palestinians and making their lives otherwise uh, unbearable. I, I, I'd like to move on also, just before I forget, with regard to the flooding, it's also worth noting that because of the power outages, which are now less than six hours of electricity a day, if I'm not mistaken, there's a lot of raw sewage uh, that isn't able to be pumped out, so a lot of the floodwaters that we're seeing are full of raw sewage as well. Is that correct? Yes, so that's correct. Basically, uh, the lack of fuel uh, and cooking gas, um, it, it, it's not only uh, six hours of electricity that I can now, it comes down to even three hours of electricity per day. And this is causing lots of problems. I, as you said, the sewage, uh, the sodium, uh, the family cannot have any other source of heating. That's why. It will that's what is caused the death of these people. Well, I, I don't know. I, I hope it's uh, only darkest before the dawn really applies in this case because it hardly seems it could get much worse. Um, nor, if we can, moving to the hunger strikers. There was a development this week as well with a long-term hunger striker. Can you give us an update on that? Uh, yes, the uh, Jordanian uh, hunger striker in the Israeli prison, Zala Hamad, uh, he just he ended uh, his eight months, something like 200 uh, days of hunger strike after uh, the Israeli occupation uh, prison service uh, accepted his demands. And his demands were uh, first to uh, accept the visa of his wife and uh, children to fly all over from Jordan uh, to West Bank and uh, then to the um, to the president uh, so he can see his uh, family because he did not see them for the past uh, years. Uh, also to allow his uh, second de um, second degree cousins and uh, family members in Jerusalem to visit him. The third one was to. Um, to start working on his eye uh, surgery, Ala Ahmad uh, was suffering from uh, several problems with his eyes, uh, and the Israeli occupation prison services have been um, ignoring uh, his calls and his demands for uh, the surgery. But now they have accepted, and he ended his. Uh, well, you know, this is, this is a really an, a, a strong indication of just how bad things are for the people in Palestine, that, that hunger strikers offer some of the greatest hope for, for actually beating the system that you're fighting. And, and I, I really want to try and remind people of, of my Irish uh, brothers and sisters and the battles that they fought against the British Empire and the meaning of, of people like Bobby Sands, who actually died um, while on a hunger strike. There's tremendous power and conviction in, the, in these people who really feel like they have nothing to lose and are willing to sacrifice themselves. And so many have come very close 
in the Israeli dungeons over the last couple of years. And I, I'd, I'd really like to try and remind people out there who are watching just how serious it has to be whereby you are willing to starve yourself to death. And this is going to happen. I have no doubt whatsoever that there will be another mass hunger strike, which had, in my opinion, really brought Israel to its knees. And it signed a deal just like the British did uh, with, with the hunger strikers in, northern, in the north of Ireland. And just like the British, the Israelis have broken that deal on many different levels. And, and it, it required that the Irish did the same thing again. So I, I would not be surprised at all if the hunger strikes continue in mass in Palestine. And I, I, I hope and pray that everyone who cares about Palestine will give all of their love and support to the Palestinian hunger strikers if they choose to do this once again. Nor, as always, it's really a, a pleasure to have you on. Please stay safe, my sister, and ultimately, uh, Keep us abreast of what's happening. We'll, we'll be back to you, I think, in two more weeks. Thank you. You're welcome. And this is my responsibility to, to share what is happening inside Gaza. As, as we can see, most of the Western media do not cover these uh, news and the situation in Gaza. So it's my pleasure and it's my responsibility as a Palestinian uh, to report. And it's a pleasure for me to be uh, your correspondent in this program. Well, with that, my sister, you, you stay safe, and uh, let's make sure that we get all the reports that we, we need from you each and every week, hopefully. Okay, my sister, you take care. And with that, we'll uh, be back to the program in just a few moments. And we recorded that interview yesterday with Noor, who I think serves as a perfect example of the kind of courage and integrity that we need a whole lot more of here in the West, because there are a lot of people out there who aren't doing a fraction of what this young lady is doing in Gaza. Now, getting back to actually changing these uh, things on the ground, I mean, the, the life for the people of Gaza is unbearable, but what are we going to do to try and stop this madness and actually express our humanity and make sure that our brothers and sisters in Gaza and Africa and other parts of the world are actually going to be able to live a dignified life? Well, that brings us back to where we started with this program, and that would be the financial system. And in particular, if you really want to understand the Middle East, we touched on it a bit earlier, but this video is the best one that I've seen in 15 minutes or less, in fact it's only 11 minutes, uh, where we can actually understand what is the petrodollar system, how does it affect us, and more importantly, how does it really deny the people of the Middle East any kind of decent living at all. So without further ado, please enjoy the road to World War III. Why did the United States attack Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Yemen? Why are U.S. operatives helping to destabilize Syria? And why is the United States government so intent on taking down Iran, in spite of the fact that Iran has not attacked any country since 1798? And what's next? What are we headed for? When you look at the current trajectory that we're on, it doesn't make any sense at all if you evaluate it based on what we're taught in school. And it doesn't make any sense if you base your worldview on the propaganda that the mainstream media tries to pass off as news. But it makes perfect sense once you know the real motives of the powers that be. In order to understand those motives, we first have to take a look at history. In 1945, the Bretton Woods Agreement established the dollar as the world reserve currency, which meant that international commodities were priced in dollars. The agreement, which gave the United States a distinct financial advantage, was made under the condition that those dollars would remain redeemable for gold at a consistent rate of $35 per ounce. The United States promised not to print very much money, but this was on the honor system, because the Federal Reserve refused to allow any audits or supervision of its printing presses. In the years leading up to 1970, expenditures in the Vietnam War made it clear to many countries that the U.S. was printing far more money than it had in gold. And in response, they began to ask for their gold back. This, of course, set off a rapid decline in the value of the dollar. The situation climaxed in 1971, when France attempted to withdraw its gold, and Nixon refused. On August 15th, he made the following announcement. I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. The United States. This was obviously not a temporary suspension, as he claimed, but rather a permanent default. And for the rest of the world who had entrusted the United States with their gold, 
it was outright theft. In 1973, President Nixon asked King Faisal of Saudi Arabia to accept only U.S. dollars as payment for oil and to invest any excess profits in U.S. Treasury bonds, notes, and bills. In return, Nixon offered military protection for Saudi oil fields. The same offer was extended to each of the world's key oil producing countries, and by 1975, every member of OPEC had agreed to only sell their oil in U.S. dollars. The act of moving the dollar off of gold and tying it to foreign oil instantly forced every oil importing country in the world to start maintaining a constant supply of Federal Reserve paper. And in order to get that paper, they would have to send real physical goods to America. This was the birth of the petrodollar. Paper went out, everything America needed came in, and the United States got very, very rich as a result. It was the largest financial con in recorded history. The arms race of the Cold War was a game of poker. Military expenditures were the chips, and the US had an endless supply of chips. With the petrodollar under its belt, it was able to raise the stakes higher and higher, outspending every other country on the planet, until eventually US military expenditures surpassed that of all other nations in the world combined. The Soviet Union never had a chance. The collapse of the communist bloc in 1991 removed the last counterbalance to American military might. The United States was now an undisputed superpower with no rival. Many hoped that this would mark the beginning of a new era of peace and stability. Unfortunately, there were those in high places who had other ideas. Within that same year, the US invaded Iraq in the first Gulf War. And after crushing the Iraqi military and destroying their infrastructure, including water purification plants and hospitals, crippling sanctions were imposed which prevented that infrastructure from being rebuilt. These sanctions, which were initiated by Bush Sr. and sustained throughout the entire Clinton administration, lasted for over a decade and were estimated to have killed over 500,000 children. The Clinton administration was fully aware of these figures. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. it. Ms. Albright, what exactly was it that was worth killing 500,000 kids for? In November of 2000, Iraq began selling its oil exclusively in euros. This was a direct attack on the dollar and on U.S. financial dominance, and it wasn't going to be tolerated. In response, the U.S. government, with the assistance of the mainstream media, began to build up a massive propaganda campaign claiming that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and was planning to use them. In 2003, the U.S. invaded, and once they had control of the country, oil sales were immediately switched back to dollars. This is particularly notable due to the fact that switching back to the dollar meant a 15 to 20 percent loss in revenue due to the euro's higher value. It doesn't make any sense at all unless you take the petrodollar into account. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said. He reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. 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 Let's take a look at the events of the past decade and see if you see a pattern. In Libya... Gaddafi was in the process of organizing a bloc of African countries to create a gold-based currency called the dinar, which they intended to use to replace the dollar in that region. U.S. and NATO forces helped destabilize and topple the Libyan government in 2011, and after taking control of the region, U.S. armed rebels executed Gaddafi in cold blood and immediately set up the Libyan Central Bank. Iran has been actively campaigning to pull oil sales off of the dollar for some time now and it has recently secured agreements to begin trading its oil in exchange for gold. In response, the U.S. government, with mainstream media assistance, has been attempting to build international support for military strikes on the pretext of preventing Iran from building a nuclear weapon. In the meantime, they established sanctions which U.S. officials openly admit are aimed at causing a collapse of the Iranian economy. Syria is Iran's closest ally, and they are bound by mutual defense agreements. 
The country is currently in the process of being destabilized with covert assistance from NATO. And though Russia and China have warned the United States not to get involved, the White House has made statements within the past month indicating that they are considering military intervention. It should be clear that military intervention in Syria and Iran isn't being considered. It's a foregone conclusion just as it was in Iraq and Libya. The U.S. is actively working to create the context which gives them the diplomatic cover to do what they already have planned. The motive for these invasions and covert actions becomes clear when we look at them in their full context and connect the dots. Those who control the United States understand that even if a few countries begin to sell their oil in another currency, it will set off a chain reaction and the dollar will collapse. They understand that there is absolutely nothing else holding up the value of the dollar at this point, and so does the rest of the world. But rather than accepting the fact that the dollar is nearing the end of its lifespan, the powers that be have made a calculated gambit. They have decided to use the brute force of the U.S. military to crush each and every resistant state in the Middle East and Africa. That in itself would be bad enough, but what you need to understand is that this is not going to end with Iran. China and Russia have stated publicly, and on no uncertain terms, that they will not tolerate an attack on Iran or Syria. Iran is one of their key allies, one of the last independent oil producers in the region, and they understand that if Iran falls, then they will have no way to escape the dollar without going to war. And yet the United States is pushing forward in spite of the warnings. What we are witnessing here is a trajectory that leads straight to the unthinkable. It's a trajectory that was mapped out years ago in full awareness of the human consequences. But who was it that put us on this course? What kind of psychopath is willing to intentionally set off a global conflict that will lead to millions of deaths just to protect the value of a paper currency? It obviously isn't the president. The decision to invade Libya, Syria, and Iran was made long before Obama had risen to the national spotlight. And yet, he's carrying out his duty just like the puppets that preceded him. So who is it that pulls the strings? Often the best answer to questions like this are found by asking another question. Qui bono? Who benefits? Obviously those who have the power to print the dollar out of thin air have the most to lose if the dollar were to fall. And since 1913, that power has been held by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is a private entity owned by a conglomerate of the most powerful banks in the world. And the men who control those banks are the ones who pull the strings. To them, this is just a game. Your life and the lives of those you love are just pawns on their chessboard. And like a spoiled four-year-old who tips the board onto the floor when they start to lose, the powers that be are willing to start World War III to keep control of the global financial system. Remember that when these wars extend and accelerate. Remember that when your son or your neighbor's son comes back home in a flag-draped coffin. Remember that when they point the finger at the new boogeyman. Because the madmen who are running this show will take this as far as you allow them to. So how much time do we have left? It's a question I hear constantly, but it's the wrong question. Asking how much time we have left is a passive posture. It's the attitude of a prisoner who's waiting to be taken out to a ditch and shot in the back of the head. What are our chances? Can we change course? Also the wrong question. The odds don't matter anymore. If you understand what we're facing, then you have a moral responsibility to do everything in your power to alter the course that we're on, regardless of the odds. It's only when you stop basing your involvement on the chances of success that success actually becomes possible. To strip the ill-begotten power from the financial elites and to bring these criminal cartels to justice will require nothing less than a revolution. The government is not going to save us. The government is completely infiltrated and corrupts the core. Looking to them for a solution at this point is utterly naive. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much to Storm Clouds Gathering. That is a phenomenal film and it shows the power that we as people have because despite the fact that we can be outspent billions to one by the mainstream media propaganda machine and lied to by our governments, we have one single thing going in our favor and it's the most powerful thing of all and that is the truth. That is the truth about the financial system, the petrodollar system, its real intentions and how it is turning us into a world that tempts a third world war and that is the real issue now isn't it When we talk about the Middle East we talk about a tinderbox that's ready to be set alight and the psychopaths who are at the top of this power pyramid are absolutely willing to set that alight because it's the only thing that they can do to actually preserve the system of tyranny that is inherent 
in their existence. And that brings us to what we can do. You know, earlier this week I had an interview with Russia Today. I'd like to thank Sophie and Co. and Russia Today and Press TV and the others who give me an opportunity to use the platform, including, of course, the People's Voice. And in that particular interview, I talked about the real American patriots. If we want to talk about the policies that affect the Middle East, then we can't ignore the fact that it's the U.S. population more than anyone else who affects the Middle East in the most profoundly of negative of ways. And there is, for me, a great, great hope in the U.S. because I know, I have no doubt, I've met them, and even when I went to the United States last time, treated as a terrorist as I am at the behest of Israel, who continues to say I'm a terrorist operative of Hamas, when I uh, arrived in uh, the United States the last time, I had the FBI special agent who was called on to interrogate me in a very friendly way tell me that he was sick and tired and he's not alone of Israel pulling the strings. Fighting wars for Israel is what the American sons and daughters have been doing for years now to the point that 22 American service men and women are committing suicide every single day. Now there were people in the past who would have said that I'm a traitor for the things I've said but if I'd had my way none of those people would have been sent off to fight these illegal immoral wars in which we commit war crimes and crimes against humanity but in fact I didn't win in that argument and ultimately our sons and daughters are coming home and committing suicide. And never mind the victims who we've now killed to the tune of a million, perhaps two million in Iraq alone. Millions of orphans, millions of refugees, what can we do about it? And in America, what I see is the American patriot being called on now to redeem yourself because in the White House and in the Congress you have a den of traitors. You have absolute traitors who have defied the U.S. Constitution, who they swore to uphold the Constitution. They have defied it. They are breaking the law. The supreme law of the land is the U.S. Constitution, and yet the Constitution is being treated like toilet paper. Literally, the American patriot is sitting by while this act is being carried out in front of it. The NDAA, the Patriot Act, all of this is an affront to the American patriot. It is time now for you to march, march, the U.S. military who took an oath to uphold the Constitution, march on Washington, arrest these traitors in the White House and, and in the Congress, restore the U.S. Constitution and repeal all laws that are injurious to the supreme law of the land, the Constitution. Now that is something that would make a difference right now. And if you want to give a future to your children, it is time for the real American patriots to rise. And with that, I hope that we send out a message of strength, love, truth, justice, and peace. But ultimately, let us do everything that needs to be done to ensure that this world changes for the better and that we can finally hand this world over to our children in a better way. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back in a couple of weeks if the uh, psychopaths don't shut us down. But make no mistake about it, there will be justice in this world. Thank you so much.